Right then guys, here we are for the final episode in the 1999 season in my Stewart Manager career mode on Grand Prix World. As you can see, Michael Schumacher is currently leading the Drivers' Championship, with Heinz Held Frentzen, David Coulthard and Damon Hill all still mathematically in contention for the Drivers' Championship. In the Constructors' Championship, well, Ferrari are leading the way, but McLaren are only 4 points behind them. Benetton, they're 16 points further back, so yet again they're mathematically in contention, but 16 points back with only two races left to go, that is quite a large gap to close up in a very small amount of time. However, well the previous episode was called Deja Vu, and do you know what? I'm sort of expecting this episode to also be Deja Vu, well certainly it is more than possible, because well, let me cast your mind back to this exact point in the 1998 season. Ferrari, they were leading the Constructors' Championship, they had 90 points, McLaren had 82. In the Drivers' Championship, Michael Schumacher had 60 points, Mecca Hakkinen, still driving for McLaren, had 44 points. He was 16 points back with only two races left to go. In essence, Hakkinen had to win the final two races of the season. He did, but in of itself that is irrelevant because as long as Michael Schumacher, Michael Schumacher in a Ferrari in 1998, as long as he scored five points, there was nothing Hakkinen could do. But in the final two races, Michael Schumacher scored one point. So amazingly, Mika Hakkinen won the Drivers' Championship. He closed up a 16-point lead in the final two races. That's truly staggering. He was 16 points behind with two races left to go, yet he won the Drivers' Championship by three points. McLaren also overtook Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship and won it. Two races before the end of the season, they were behind Ferrari they ended the season in front of them. Cutting back to this season's Constructors' Championship standings, you can see where I'm going because for the second season in a row, Ferrari are leading the Constructors' Championship with only two races left to run. However, in 1998, they had an eight-point lead heading into the second-to-last race and still lost. This season, they've only got a four-point lead. In the Drivers' Championship, it is a very similar potential repetition of the past because Michael Schumacher has got a 10-point lead. 10 points over Hightower Frensen in second. However, David Coulthard is only 14 points back. Damon Hill, 16 points back. Damon Hill in fourth is the same number of points behind Michael Schumacher that Hakkinen was last season. Yet, Hakkinen still won the championship. My point is, if McLaren and Hakkinen won last season's championships, there's no reason why something just as unexpected, or even to be honest, mathematically more feasible, could happen this year. Just a quick reminder that the Luxembourg Grand Prix is going to be the Formula 1 debut for William's new number 1 driver, Pierre Rainbow. The pay driver, and yes he is a pay driver, he is funding the team for $5.8 million. And actually, I do have a question about that because, well, the logical thing to do would be to, to not actually pay all of that. Because he's not racing for the entirety of the season, he's just stepped in for the final two races because Frank Williams has fired Jacques Villeneuve. The logical thing to do then would be for Pierre Rainbow to pay two sixteenths of that money for the two sixteenths of the season which he is participating in, but maybe he'll pay the whole thing. And if he does, that is a brilliant cheat, in essence, a way to have a pay driver in the car for a limited amount of time yet get all the money. Logically that shouldn't be the case, but there's a couple of other systems in the game which make me think that it might be how it works. Anyway, either way, Williams are not in a good position. It doesn't matter if they're getting money from Pierre Rainbow. He is an awful driver. Luckily, he will... Well, he's only contracted to be with the team for the remainder of this season. He is the number one driver, though. 
Staggeringly, Johnny Herbert is still the driver number two, but Pierre Rainbow, as you can see, he'll be free in the year 2000, so he might not be with the team next year. I'll be amazed if he is, though, because he's got all one star performance stats, apart from two out of five overtaking. Now, that is, oh yeah, morale, but is morale a performance stat? Don't know. Anyway, I mean, that compares to, of all the drivers, that compares to Alberto Marini, and as we've seen, he's not exactly been an amazing driver, has he? To be fair though, we have been comparing him to Mika Hakkinen, and pretty much anyone is going to look bad compared to Mika Hakkinen, but Marini, well, to be fair, it's excusable, he's got 2 out of 5 speed, and all of his other performance stats again apart from morale, which I'm not sure if that counts, is 1 out of 5, so you know, that's the sort of level of driver we're talking about when I'm talking about Pierre Rainbow. He is on a par with Marini, except Marini actually takes a salary. Pierre Rainbow has to pay for his seat, so that really does tell you a lot. Well, this is going to be exciting, the Luxembourg Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, and there is a lot to look forward to, because we've got the debut of Pierre Rainbow, which I am looking forward to, but more importantly, more interestingly than that, we have got both the Drivers' and Constructors' Championships, which are open, and in the case of both championships, could be won by more than one driver or team. Three teams still in contention for the Constructors' Championship, four drivers in contention for the Drivers' Championship. So, if there's a slip-up from any driver, a lack of reliability, it will be massively damaging. So, well, let's just find out what happens at the Nürburgring. It was incredibly close in qualifying. Heinz Held Frentzen took pole position over his teammate by one thousandth of a second. Michael Schumacher, he must feel really bummed out because he's in third place only four thousandths slower than Heinz Held Frentzen, three thousandths slower than his former teammate Eddie Irvine. It was actually very close across the board actually, there was only six tenths of a second separating the top 12 drivers. So both Benettons, both Ferraris, both McLarens, both Arrows, both Jordans and both Tyrrell drivers all separated by only six tenths of a second. So let me just run down through the grid, so it's Frentzen, Irvine, Schumacher, Coulthard, Wurt, Damon Hill, then it's Fizzy Keller in the other Ferrari in 7th, Jan Magnussen as has been the case quite often recently, he is down in 8th. Although, to be fair, with Magnussen's driver stats, it is expected, unfortunately. Having said that though, Tuero beat his Jordan teammate, Jean Alessi, so there you go. And anyway, Montoya beat Mekasalo, Shinji Nakano is the highest placed Sauber driver, then you've got Collard, then both of our drivers who did pretty poor actually. I mean there is a bit of a gap between both Tyrrell drivers and both Sauber drivers. Then there's another four tenth gap between the Sauber drivers and both Stewart drivers. Well, I say that. I did hesitate because Diniz, there's about a four tenth gap, but then Takaki, he's in the one minute twenties. Mecca Hakkinen though in the one minute twenty ones and actually close to the one minute twenty twos. Then you've got Trulli, Marini, Rossette, Johnny Herbert, then Pierre Rainbow. Although, to Rainbow's credit, bearing in mind Johnny Herbert, during the early days of his racing career, I think in the early days of his Formula 1 career, certainly before he got into Formula 1, Johnny Herbert was touted to be a future star, a future Formula 1 world champion potentially, but unfortunately he never quite got there. But... Regardless, Johnny Herbert is still a respected and somewhat experienced Formula 1 driver, yet Pierre Rainbow in his Formula 1 debut mid-season was only half a tenth slower, just over half a tenth slower than Johnny Herbert. So actually for Pierre Rainbow in his debut Formula 1 race to be that close to Johnny Herbert, that is pretty impressive. The track was very dry for the qualifying session, and it is going to be dry for the race. 
Now that is significant because if it were to be a wet race, then we all know who would benefit. It would be the two wet weather specialists of Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher. Heinz Helfrensen and David Coulthard, for that matter, their wet weather stats are reasonable, but they're certainly not on the same level as Hill's or Schumacher's. But because it's going to be a dry race, that means all four of the championship contenders can pull something out of the bag, but Heinz Helfrensen, of course, is the best placed driver to do that. Well, Heinz Helfrensen may well have been the best placed driver when the race started, but when it ended, he finished in 4th place, behind his other three championship rivals. David Coulthard won the 1999 Luxembourg Grand Prix. Michael Schumacher finished in 2nd, Damon Hill in 3rd. Both Arrows drivers round off the points places, Alex Wurtz in 5th and Jan Magnussen in 6th. Then you've got Tuero, Montoya, Nakano, Solo, Salo I should say, not Solo. Mika Salo in 10th, Emmanuel Collard 11th, then Pedro Diniz, the first of our two drivers, he was lapped once, then you got Alberto Marini just one place back, he was lapped three times, as was Johnny Herbert and Ricardo Rosset, and actually quite a few drivers retired. Fizzy Keller retired with a engine failure, as did, well, as did Tua Takaki, actually. Hakkinen and Jano Trulli both retired due to accidents, possibly connected. Jean Alessi out with a gearbox issue. And, well, Pierre Rainbow, Pierre Rainbow, out due to a driver mistake. Now, that is the most predictable thing that happened in this race. As it stands, Michael Schumacher hasn't won this season's Drivers' Championship yet. However, Damon Hill and Heinz Harald Frensen are both out of the running. David Coulthard, though, is still in with a shot. David Coulthard is 10 points behind Michael Schumacher. So, theoretically, well, this game is slightly odd, actually, because, of course, in real life, the Drivers' Championship were two drivers to finish on the same points total. It would be decided by who won the most number of races. And I'm not sure how many races either Schumacher or Coulthard has won, but honestly, well, I'm not actually 100% certain whether the game factors that, because when two drivers are tied on points, it actually seems to decide at random which goes on top. So, to all intents and purposes, Michael Schumacher has won this season's Drivers' Championship, but it isn't sealed yet. In the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari have lost the lead to McLaren. So Fisichella's retirement has cost the Italian team, but what I think was more detrimental to their campaign was the fact David Coulthard in a McLaren won the Luxembourg Grand Prix and a Ferrari driver didn't. So McLaren have got a four points lead on Ferrari, so actually the points gap between the two teams is the same as it was, it's just the teams have swapped places. I think in the end we've actually done alright with securing sponsorship because, as you can see, I'm about to guarantee the team an extra half a million dollars per season for the next two seasons. So I'll sign a deal with Brastemp, although half a million dollars, that's fantastic, it's money, you can't knock it, but Silicon Graphics, another two-star sponsor which we've signed with, they'll be giving us 1.1 million dollars per season over the next two seasons. Brastemp are the same quality of sponsor, yet they'll be paying us less than half the amount of Silicon Graphics. Yeah, we've been in this situation before, we haven't fully finished designing next season's chassis and we've run out of time. Although there is one small trick up my sleeve, but I don't think it's going to completely finish off the chassis. Research. During one of the mid-season testing sessions, I did make sure I filled up the research bar just because it could benefit us with, well, chassis completion, but also with technology completion, although I'll get back to this in a second. Anyway, let me activate the research bar and how much... Actually, that's done more than I thought it would. Okay, that's fantastic. So there you go. The testing I did earlier on in the season, 
to fill up the research bar, I finally utilised it and that means next season's chassis has completed its design process, albeit just, just in time. But actually this does put a lot of stress on our engineering department because they've got to manufacture two cars before the end of the season. Obviously we do run three cars but the testing car doesn't matter because well and at the start of this season we manufactured the third car that was one of the first things I did but you do need to manufacture two cars before the start of the next season otherwise it's game over and that's doable for us it's fine but it does mean we can't well, firstly, we can't upgrade the technology or build any spare parts. Luckily, I have got four spare parts available. I made sure to have some in reserve specifically for when we built a couple of cars. So next season's car has been dealt with, and because it's been fully completed, that means I can guarantee it will be 60% rated. I believe... I could be wrong, but I think this means the suspensions and clutch from this season will be carried on over to next season, but brakes, electronics, gearbox crucially, hydraulics and throttles will be reset. Now the gearbox, I just finally, finally finished designing the gearbox upgrade, but even if I had the staff to construct it, it wouldn't be worth it anyway because the gearbox is going to be reset for next season, so it would be pointless manufacturing it, I'd only use it for one race, and it's only a reliability upgrade anyway, not a performance one, so we've spent all season trying to improve the reliability of our gearbox, and we failed to do it, quite frankly, and that's tragic. But, well, let me announce something, a big... Oh, actually, I'm having... I'm having second thoughts. No, I'm going to do it, definitely, because you've got to speculate to accumulate. This, I think, is the final screen, maybe second to last screen I haven't showed you guys up until this point. Actually, I can stop hiring the wind tunnel, that'll be helpful. So yes, I am going to upgrade our factory. Now that is an expensive deal, because it's going to cost $6 million, and because I've left it until the final race of the season, I have to spend all of that money in one go. If I did it at the start of the season, these $6 million would have been broken up into 16 smaller payments. But anyway, it doesn't matter, we can just about afford the full $6 million. Now, the reason you want to upgrade your factory is because, well, as you can see, the department's limit is 50. 50 staff members. And it's going to go up, no not to 80, sorry, to 60. You could have it go up to 80 if we had a 4 star factory or even 100. Productivity would go through the roof. Commercial would be fantastic to have an extra, well in this case 14 people. It would be fantastic as it means, you know, with more people working with sponsors, potential sponsors and of course engine supplies, it means we could get deals done quicker. We would stop having sponsors being poached from under us, which we saw happen multiple times this season. It would just be brilliant. Productivity would go up because we would have more people. It's hard to even retain staff, to be honest, but that's not really the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that we can't employ more than 50 people. That is, until we improve the factory, which I'm going to do. So, I'm going to spend $6 million. This is why I desperately wanted... Well, to avoid customer deals, to get paid drivers, pretty much all of the decisions I've made up until this point has led to this. Improving the factory and something else I really do want to do is... Yeah, improve the CAD and CAM facilities, although that's going to... Actually, no, because we... Yes, that will... We will still have some money. Luckily, though, the actual cost isn't taken into account until after the Grand Prix, which is good because we're making money at every single Grand Prix anyway, so I'm going to get maxed out CAD and CAM facilities. Each, well the wind tunnel obviously goes in the wind tunnel facility, that's pretty self-explanatory, but I think the CAD facility, yeah that makes sense, computer-aided design goes into the design area and CFD simulation, that 
is taken up by the CAM facility. Or maybe not, actually. Maybe it's the model design. Either way, each facility, each factory upgrade, fits into a facility. The better the facility, the more progress you make. So that means the design stage of chassis design will happen much quicker. So actually, pretty much every single upgrade I've done over the past few minutes is aimed at making the team more productive, able to upgrade ourselves quicker and do more in a shorter amount of time because, well, with more staff we'll be able to do more and with a CAD facility we'll be able to design our chassis much quicker and the CAM facility also links into, I think, the model design stage actually but even still, just by spending a few hundred thousand dollars on getting a maxed out CAD and CAM facility, that means we'll be able to design chassis and I think other components as well but most importantly chassis much quicker. Here we go, off to Japan for the final round of the season. Michael Schumacher has pretty much got the Drivers' Championship wrapped up, but the Constructors' Championship is still up in the air. McLaren have the slight points lead, but that could so easily and quickly be overturned. Anyway, let's head off into Suzuka for the final round of the 1999 Formula 1 season. Well, a heavy rain qualifying session near as damn it rules out any possibility that David Coulthard could win the Drivers' Championship. However, it doesn't really benefit either Ferrari or McLaren because both teams have got a wet weather specialist, Ferrari have got Michael Schumacher, McLaren Damon Hill, but both of their, I was going to say second drivers, that would be the wrong term, but both of their other drivers aren't massively skilled in wet weather. David Coulthard and Fizzy Keller probably similarly skilled in wet conditions. So, heavy rain actually doesn't really favour one team or the other. Michael Schumacher, of course, with Jean Alesi in second. Actually, Jean Alesi is very good in wet weather conditions, but I could be wrong, but I think Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill both have 5 out of 5 wet weather stats, Jean Alesi 4 out of 5. So it's Michael Schumacher on pole position for the 1999 Japanese Grand Prix. Jean Alesi is in second with Damon Hill in third. Giancarlo Fisichella in the other Ferrari is ahead of David Coulthard who is in the other McLaren but he is still McLaren's driver number one. Supposedly, anyway, Alex Wurz is in 6th, Shinji Nakano, he never fails to amaze me, Shinji Nakano is in 7th. Heinzhard Frentzen heading into the previous Grand Prix was a Drivers' Championship contender. In this very race, he qualified down in 8th. Yes, he did beat his teammate Eddie Irvine, but that's not really impressive, I mean, we're talking about someone who was, up until very recently, the runner-up in the Drivers' Championship and he's qualified down in 8th. Yes, he did beat Mika Hakkinen, and Hakkinen is very adept in the wet weather, but Hakkinen's in a prost. Of course he's going to qualify low down. In fact, for Mika Hakkinen to qualify in 10th with that car, that is some going. Esteban Tuero really didn't do well compared to his teammate, and actually the same can be said with Jan Magnussen, who qualified down in 12th. But... I mean, it's fairly obvious that both of those drivers aren't wet weather specialists. Congratulations to Pierre Rainbow. Of course, this is only Pierre Rainbow's second Formula 1 race. Qualifying was done in heavy rain conditions. He was only three temps slower than his teammate. And Pierre Rainbow beat Alberto Marini. Rainbow and Marini, they're both on a par. They're both drivers who weren't originally in F1 and shouldn't be. They really shouldn't, but Rainbow, in a worse car, was quicker than Marini by half a second. And, well, Ricardo Rosset really did let himself down there, really did. To be fair, he is driving a Minardi, but, I mean, he's behind Marini and, more embarrassingly, Pierre Rainbow, although I think the driver who's really got egg on his face is Emmanuel Collard, because Emmanuel Collard has been banned after qualifying. So it's going to be a dry Japanese Grand Prix, so that should actually level out the playing field. Who knows? I'm still expecting Michael Schumacher to do well because 
he's got the natural talent and the car to win the race. Michael Schumacher has won the 1999 Japanese Grand Prix and with it, the 1999 Drivers' Championship. Damon Hill finished in second, Eddie Irvine did much better compared to qualifying as he finished in third. David Coulthard finished in fourth, Heinz Howard Friends in fifth, and Alex Wurz rounds off Arrow's amazing season with a sixth place finish. He beat Giancarlo Fisichella, then you've got Jan Magnussen who finished in eighth. Then you've got Tuero and Nicano. Those two drivers never cease to amaze me because they're both former Minardi drivers. They're both pay drivers. They're both in middling teams. And Nicano especially does pretty well, to be fair. You're comparing Nicano to Collard, and Collard's not exactly amazing. But Tuero, on this occasion, finished in ninth. Yeah, sure, we can't actually compare him to his teammates because presumably... Presumably, yep, there you go. Jean Alessi retired with an engine failure, as did Mika Salo, but what caught my eye there was Tua Takaki out with a gearbox issue. Now, that's brilliant. I said it would be pointless, manufacturing the improved reliability gearbox. As it turns out, nearly pointless. Anyway, Takaki out with a gearbox issue, Rainbow out with a gearbox issue, and Pedro Diniz was the first driver to retire from the race due to having an engine issue. And do you know what? <sighs> a really poor season for us. Financially fantastic, but on track, a really poor season has ended in a way befitting our season as a whole. There we go, confirmed in black and white. Michael Schumacher is the 1999 driver's champion. And he's won it convincingly, David Coulthard in the end, 17 points back. Heinz Howard Frentzen... <laughs> Heinz Howard Frentzen, 21 points behind Michael Schumacher. I think, arguably, the driver who should have won the championship, certainly I am not saying Michael Schumacher doesn't deserve it, because you could certainly quite easily argue a case for Michael Schumacher having been the best driver all season, but... I personally would give that honour to Damon Hill. I really would, because Damon Hill, I think, suffered more reliability issues than Michael Schumacher. There was a time in the middle of the season where Damon Hill just couldn't finish a race. It was actually tragic, it really was. Damon Hill, he just... I think he had the championship lead, and it just slipped away. Alex Wurtz, the Arrows driver, has finished this season in 5th. Then you've got Fizzy Keller in 6th, Eddie Irvine in 7th, Jan Magnussen all the way down in 8th with 23 points, although I still believe that Jan Magnussen did exceed his driver ratings. Because Magnussen, if you're going based on the driver stats, he's awful, but you know, he still finished 8th in the Drivers' Championship. He still beat Jean Alessi. And actually, I think come the end of the season, actually probably if you take the season as a whole, I think the Arrows car was probably the fourth quickest one anyway, so I think Magnussen finished pretty much where you would expect him to anyway. Jean Alessi finished ninth in the Drivers' Championship. Alessi has been fantastic this season, certainly one of the standout drivers. A couple of his race results are suspicious to say the least, because there have been a few occasions over the course of this season where himself and his teammate have been caught running driver aids illegally, and I think a couple of Alessi's good results can be attributed to that. Even still, Alessi has been fantastic all season long, especially in wet conditions. Shinji Nakano ends the season in 10th. That is fantastic for the former Minardi driver. Mika Salo and Esteban Tuero end the season in joint 11th. Then you've got Juan Pablo Montoya, who in his debut Formula 1 season and driving for Tyrrell, he scored a point. As did Emmanuel Collard again in his debut season, except he was driving for Sauber. McLaren are the 1999 Constructors Champions. That's the second year in a row they've won it, although this season they only beat Ferrari by three points. 
Benetton finished in third, Arrows, fantastic season, they are finished in fourth, way ahead of Jordan, Sauber in sixth, and actually Sauber, there was quite a big gap between Jordan and themselves come the end, but Sauber, if you're looking at purely race pace, if you discount some of Alessi's, to be honest, I think Jean Alessi is really the big difference between Jordan and Sauber, because Sauber, they've got Nakano who's impressed, Collard who's been okay, but, well actually Collard and Nakano have been fairly equal, but Jordan, they've got Tuero who's kind of on a par, but Alessi is that amazing driver who pulls out the amazing results. Salba don't have that, neither do Tyrrell, but Tyrrell, once again, fantastic season. Last season, 1998, they were on their knees, on a par with Minardi. They were consistently back markers, nowhere near scoring points. This season, they finished 7th in the Constructors' Championship and scored 4 points. Only one behind Salba. Tyrrell have done amazingly well. Well, that's a vote of confidence. I've been named as the least effective manager in F1. Meanwhile, Ron Dennis was named as the best F1 manager. That is over the course of the Japanese Grand Prix weekend. But over the entirety of the season, I was named as the worst manager of the year. Now, I would dispute that because I think Frank Williams has been worse. I mean, you could argue that Williams have been in a worse position this season, so Frank Williams has had less to work with, but Williams were in a bad position because of the decisions Frank Williams made. I mean, you can't really, you can't really say Frank Williams has done well. Anyway, I mean, to be fair, I can't exactly argue I've done well either, to be honest. I just think I've done less badly than Frank. Ron Dennis has been voted as the Formula 1 Manager of the Year. I can't argue against that, I really can't. Ken Tyrrell, second best manager of the season. Couldn't agree more. Tom Walkinshaw, third best manager of the season. I think that's fair enough because Tyrrell and Arrows have done amazingly well. Truly spectacular. Oh yeah, of course, yep, this screen glitched again. Jim Wright, supposedly the driver's champion. Last year, supposedly, it was Frank Williams, who was the driver's champion. Fantastic. Anyway, here we go into the year 2000. That's what $625,000 has got me. A maxed out design facility and model design facility. So... That, in combination with the extra staff capacity, means firstly we shouldn't have to worry about not completing the design of the following season's chassis in time, but also means we'll be able to improve our current season's chassis much quicker. It may well be a brand new season, a new year, and even a new millennium, but some things don't change and that is staff resigning. To be fair, with the low morale across the board, I don't really blame them, but we're on the up and up. This season will be better for us than the previous two seasons. So that's pretty much everything for this episode. I've had a quick look around, and there have been some quite interesting developments, all of which I will say for the next episode. But one thing which I will say, because it's in the news already... Mika Hakkinen has announced that he will retire from Formula 1 at the end of the season. So we're going to say goodbye to a So we're going to have to say goodbye to one of the biggest names in the sport. But not before he's had a chance to become a triple world champion. Mika Hakkinen will still be racing with Prost next season, but Prost unlike this season should have one of the best chassis on the grid. Trust me, I don't think the 2000 season is going to disappoint. I'm looking forward to it, I hope you guys are, and you can join me in the next episode in which we'll be starting off the 2000 Formula 1 season. So I'll see you guys then.